Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the football grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan, and uh, it is the last weekend in March before, before Easter. Day. Yeah, yeah. I am in uh, I am in sunny Florida on my annual spring training opening day trip. I have three spring training games, three Rays games. Three high school games and a lightning game in seven in eight days. So beat that, everybody. There's no giant losses in that mix, which is really good. It's a uh, you got a full schedule ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Roomating with the parents for a week. It's been a lot of fun so far. <laughs> we'll revisit that next week, but so far so good. Everything is going yeah. great. I was gonna say must not have been very long so far. For more information on this, be sure to watch any Seinfeld episode. Cue yeah. <laughs> in when George lives with his parents. No, they've been great. They've been great. Um, the league got together this week and uh, fresh off of the press today as we're recording this, the NFL has banned the hip drop tackle. It is a 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Um, I We have not talked about this, you and I. So I'm actually interested in your take on this. Uh, so what are your thoughts? I, I, I found this to be kind of interesting because a lot of times – well, actually, you know, I, I just found this interesting. I'll explain later. But what did, what did you think about this? I think I knew it was going to happen. I just think it's something where it's going to cause a lot of aggravation and a lot of complaining by players. Well, I think – We've watched in every sport, every time there's changes like this, that there's an adjustment period and things get resolved. So, you know, I think once you get past the initial period of, you know, up in arms and they're they're ruining the game, they're making it easy. They're not, you know, it's it's ta- it's two hand touch football. I think once once players adjust, you know, it's just it'll be something we don't think about that much. I find this to be. Uh, I hope you're right. Um, I find this to be frustrating because the the rules have stripped the defenders from really playing uh, loose and free. And it has – every change to the rule book has allowed the offense to play looser and more free. Yeah, I do I do want to put one caveat into this too. And I think it's, I think it's actually kind of important. I've never played football. I've never played in any organized level from peewee through junior high, high school, college, pro – you know, uh, old timers league. Um, so, you know, to me, I may have a, a completely different take than, you know, the players themselves or former players or like you're taking a key as- aspect of what we do away from the game and making it again, like to your point, another disadvantage that I have in trying to stop an opponent from scoring or gaining yards or keeping possession and things. So I get it. I mean, just to me, my, I might sound a little kind of like, eh, They'll adjust to it and they'll figure it out. But I, I can certainly empathize with people who are like, this is a much bigger deal than I'm making it out to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually do think that you make a good point uh, in, in that, you know, rules have changed. And uh, over time, this is the tale as old as time. And you adjust and you move on. And, it, you know, it's always, a, it's always a bigger deal. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a good point. My, my thing is that this is kind of like another domino in the same string of dominoes that have affected one side of the ball. And I, I think that the hip drop tackle was a sort of saving grace, uh, I think, as, as the ability to just kind of hit somebody as hard as you can has been taken away um, from defenders. You know, I'm simplifying a lot when I'm talking about this, but the ability to just kind of run head first and play as loose and free as possible as a defender has been taken away. The hip drop tackle was kind of a way for guys to make a tackle that was, you know, a cleaner tackle that was, you know, something that was legal. It, you know, this was something that was kind of taught to guys. And uh, to take it away, I think, is just going to lead to a lot more sloppy tackling because I don't think the defenders really even know what to do. But I, I also think that, you know, there's there's an injury element to why this was taken away. But what's really interesting to me is that in the past when we've had rule changes and rule change proposals to, uh, you know, certain practices, there's been a longer deliberation, a longer debate 
than something like this where suddenly it's unanimously taken away. And I, I think it's kind of interesting because if you take a look at a lot of the injuries that might have happened from hip drop tackles, I think that some level of it can be attributed to an offensive player trying to break a tackle and continuing to try and run when he's wrapped up. And it's really interesting to punish the defender for things like that. And I, I don't know. It just seems to me like this rule was you know proposed and passed before there was a lot of debate about it. Well, here's my thought about that is that we don't know all of the back channel communication that goes on between player association and the league, you know, coaches and players, owners and coaches and all these different things. And it may be very possible that when informally discussions about we want to do this, everybody kind of came to a, yeah, that makes sense. So it became not so much a negotiation of or a, uh, you know, a deliberation. Are we going to, you know, change the rule or not to more of a we're all in agreement of it. Let's just make this happen. And now that's my speculation, my, you know, my little theory. I don't know if that means anything at all, but it's very possible. The league has clearly made a decision that player safety, protecting the players and keeping their star players on the field is more important than the <laughs> integrity of the game is not the right word I want to use, but the, you know, the yin and the yang versus offense and defense. I think they are willing to say if this is a league that's not going to be as violent and it's more of an offensive league than a defensive league because they have more and more advantages from you know a skill set perspective and now from a rules perspective, they are willing to give that up because they do not want to have on Monday Night Football in December no Patrick Mahomes playing. You know, Saquon Barkley – a good reason Saquon Barkley probably is not with the Giants is because he can't stay on the field. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm putting the correlation between this rule and Saquon Barkley by any stretch, but this league wants its best players playing. It wants the best product possible. And I think they're just willing to, you know, sacrifice some of that competitive nature and history of the game to protect itself. And, you know, ratings, attendance, gambling numbers kind of tell us that even though these rule changes have happened, sport is more popular than ever and growing more popular than ever. Yeah, um, I hate that that argument. That last little bit there loses me because, you know, the ratings keep going up is, is a silly thing to me because you have nothing to compare it against. That's, that goes with all sports. When the MLB does something, you have nothing to compare it against. When the NBA does something, you have nothing to compare it against because all these sports are different and none of us have any other choice. Um, so I mean, no, I mean literally, I'm literally year over year. I'm talking. I'm not talking uh, comparing the NFL to the baseball or anything. I'm just saying. No, that. I, I'm aware of that. I'm saying yes. The yeah. ratings continue to go up because there is nothing else. The sports are all pretty much spaced out, and certain things are never going to happen. Hockey is never going to overtake football. Um, right, and, but, but and no one's cannot... and no one's ever going to just mass walk away from an entire sport. It's just not right, going to happen. It, not mass walk away, but maybe just you know, not some people are just like this. This is a pussy sport now. It, all it is is flag football. And, you know, some people, but the trends from all this are more people are engaged. Now, again, there may be some anomalies like the Swifties are watching, something stupid like that. Um, but it may be the, the inclusion of legal and easy gambling has brought more people into watching more as opposed to – But I, I don't know. But I, I think that when stars don't play, individual games are hurt. And I, hang on, I, I would agree that when stars don't play, there are f less fans going that are going to watch than normal. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make for a worse game. Um, and, and I understand the. I, I, lost you. I, 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 I lost you. I'll go. I understand. You dropped out for like 15 seconds. I, I understand the NFL's position in that time is money and ratings are money and, and that's that. Um, but there is an inverse correlation that, you know, less stars mean that less casuals will watch. But less stars in a game does not mean that you will have a bad game. I think that anybody who watched 
Giants versus Packers this year on Monday Night Football enjoyed a very good game to watch, and yet it That's was true. without serious stars. Now, I understand the NFL doesn't give a shit about that, but fans of the sport are slowly going to notice you know, something that, uh, to me, honestly, I, th- this is my honest, I'm not somebody who likes a defensive game that ends 13 to 3. I don't enjoy that, but I also don't enjoy 70 to 3. Like these some of these college blowout games and, you know, offensive juggernauts. I don't enjoy watching that either. I don't think it's very fun, you know, watching Miami score 70 points. I, I think that that is also a bad product but to watch. It, I'm it, bored. Usually usually 9 times out of 10 in college is because of a a complete mismatch. Right. I, what, what, you very, I use college very, as the example because it actually happens in college, but right, right, because you have such a discre- you have a a top ten team playing a Division One AA team or an, F, an FCS team, so that you're going to get those variances a lot more because it, they are simply mismatches. They don't they should never be on the field at the same time. Those are purely put together because of money. I, I think that um, you know the, the number of times we see games that you know. The total points scored are over 90, while probably growing in the last 10 years is still not commonplace. I mean, it's it happens, but not like. I mean, oh, I think that, that that 2007 Patriots offense was like a juggernaut scoring like 31 points a game or something like that. It's like not yeah. that's not really like anything now. 31 points a game is, you know, the top five teams in the league. I mean, I, I think a good exercise to do, and I do this a lot with the NBA, is when I argue with people about is the game better now than it was 25 years ago because the quote unquote purists are like, oh, it's just three point shooting now. And I just tell people, go watch on YouTube a game from 1993 from beginning to end. Don't fast forward through anything and don't fast forward through commercials. Watch the entire game and then watch a game tonight on League Pass and tell me what's better. And that's maybe an exercise we should do ourselves is pick a random game from 1994 and just watch the entire thing and watch now and just say what is not this individual play or this thing, but just the flow of the game, the, you know, the yin and the yang of the game, you know, the, the pacing, all of this stuff. Is it a better game now than it was then? There may be more scoring now. There may be more of a discrepancy between offense versus defense now than there was then. But is the game better to watch? I'd be, I'd be curious what you think. I mean, you may have an opinion right now. Like, you don't have to do this exercise. You know, but... Um, no, I'd, I'd have to watch because I, I think that uh, I think that's a better point for the NBA, those two time periods. I think the early 2000s are probably the best time period from like 2005 through like 2009 I think are a good spot for the NFL because it just was a lot of good quarterbacks at that time in addition to a different set of rules but I you know I'm not a super purist I, I'm open to rule changes it does feel like we're changing the rules like every year or two years now uh in, in a does, significant it, way and I think a lot of it to the point you just made I just think that the lack of really good quarterbacks in this league you don't have a good quarterback. You're an offense that just bogs down. And I just don't think the NFL wants to have a punt fest or just bad football as a product. And they're trying to give teams that, you know, and give this league as a whole all the support they can to just pop up that product as much as they can. Whether they're right or wrong, I don't know. I mean, we're going to have to see. And also, rules change, and sometimes rules change back. If it's something where it's just, we made a mistake. We've gone too far. They will reverse a rule. It's happened in every sport. So I think it's just let's see what the actual effect of it is before we say, you know, death to the NFL or, you know, off with their heads. Um, but last note before moving on, in order to fully assess the effect of that rule, it's important not to know how many times it has been flagged, but how many times players have been fined for it because the NFL's true enforcement comes after Sunday when they re-review penalties and they essentially issue harsher and more uh, impactful penalties, ones that kind of scar the memory of players, that's when it really happens. And that's what the NFL wants to be enforced, essentially. That's them correcting the officials. So don't think because you only remember seeing it flagged five times in one year in the games that you watched means that it's no big deal because if three players are getting fined a week, it's a bigger deal. 
and remember the majority of fans watch their own team they right. don't watch the entire league every week we're not we don't have 11 monitors in our room watching every game all the time you watch your game i mean I try my best on Sunday when I'm not traveling or not going to a giant game to watch other stuff, but I'm focusing on the Giants. So I know pass interference happens all the time because of this against the Giants, but I, you know, you need that bigger sample. And mm-hmm. us as casual fans are not the ones to make that, uh, you know, they. This goes back to your point about it seems like it happened pretty quickly. Again, it didn't just go happen when somebody made a phone call and said it's in. I, again, I think there was back channeling i think there was some kind of off the record discussions and you know to bring it to a but i think i think the consensus has happened really class that they really did grease it, the skids on that and it moved very quickly yeah um speaking about uh you know we we mentioned quarterbacks and their value and you know the lack of them right now as opposed to the uh golden era that we sort of enjoyed from 2001 i would say i would say 99 from peyton manning entering to what would you say like 2016 15 i'd say so i mean you can also make a i mean really if you want to go even back further i guess from the 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 draft with marino and elway and those guys were you know that first true yeah playing alongside with montana and Mm -hmm. you know them i mean maybe we say okay but that point is that era is over (laughs) and we are in a different one now yeah, we're we're kind of in like a quarterback void where we've got like head and shoulders Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. You got some leftover Matt Stafford. The fact that Matt Stafford is right there in that conversation, I think, uh, says everything because he was like the forgotten guy in the group just, we were just talking about. I just listed off, you know, going back in time: Elway, Montana, uh, Marino, uh, all of these guys, Matt Stafford doesn't hold any of those jock straps on nope. that list yeah. and, and yet he's probably top five right now so you know we, we get into this conversation uh as jj mccarthy has sort of become the uh the draft hot button issue uh i think you could have seen that coming a while away um what is your overall take on jj mccarthy and and you know is he quarterback four you know, does he go one, two, three, four? Does he go higher than that? You know, does he slip and fall? You know, does a Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, you know, better at their position than he is? Or, you know, how, how does this work? I, I think, first of all, first and foremost, we are right in the middle of narrative season. I think this is where this is where agents make their money. This is where agents again, using the term back channeling again, they are the ones planning stories. They are the ones who are hyping up their clients to make them as attractive and as draft worthy as possible. So anything you hear rising and falling when nothing is really happening right now, there's no, the combines over the pro days are over It is now it's just, you know, it's, it's a whispering contest and, uh, or, you know, whispering campaign. So, you know, J.J. McCarthy comes from arguably one of the five most popular and biggest college football programs in the country with an enormous alumni base and an enormous uh, pull. Um, my take on him, he is clearly behind the other three quarterbacks. Um, I also think we have so much time between the national championship game and with the first pick in the NFL draft, you know, Chicago selects X that it's just the normal ebb and flow of who we want to talk about now, who's the darling. And I think right now, you know, in this little media cycle, J.J. McCarthy's the guy. Um, I don't know. I don't know at this point if people in war rooms is really like starting to do the second take and third take. I think it, by this point, they kind of know who they want. I think a lot of this is is noise, and I think it's clicks, and I think it's, you know, a, a, a football fan, of a, a football uh, you know, loves information, loves reading about this. They love the soap opera of it and they love information. And when you start to see these stories planning about JJ McCarthy, it's like, Oh, you know, I'm going to watch, you know, NFL network. I'm going to watch ESPN. I'm going to listen to this stupid show. I'm going to listen to the good shows. I'm going to, you know, what's really going on out there. And I, to me, he's still the fourth best. Um, I, I don't see how that changes right now from anything that's happened in the last couple of weeks, to be very honest. 
So I, I think I agree with a lot of that. Um, I, I'm pretty certain that he is the fourth best, in my opinion, from a physical skill set point of view. But there, you know, that that there are certain areas where I think he's closer than others. You know, from an arm strength standpoint, I'm not sure how good he is. But you know, from an athleticism and ability to escape the pocket and run kind of thing, I don't think he's super far behind any of the other guys. Um, you know, there's intangibles with JJ McCarthy. Um, the dude is just kind of a winner and there, you know, that is something that's unquantifiable. Um, okay. Stop right. Stop right there. Okay. The three, the three things you just described JJ McCarthy are the three things that people describe Tim Tebow about. And I get it. It's not completely apples and apples, but people's justification of why Tim Tebow should be drafted high and should be given all the chances in the world in the NFL because of intangibles. He's a winner, you know, is el- elusive in a different way in the pocket. Uh, arm straight may not be as good as the other quarterbacks coming out, but you know, he was, you know, <laughs> I would, I would, I, I see what you're doing, but you're, you're, there were mechanical issues with Tim Tebow that J.J. McCarthy just simply doesn't have. There's a, there, Tim Tebow was a far worse prospect. I know what you're saying. You know, the, the highest highs of J.J. McCarthy are the same as Tim Tebow's. Yeah, uh, it, your, selling, is, is your what, selling points for him are the Tim right. Tebow selling points. But, it, but, but, I mean, at the same time, the low points, you know, the, some of the things that you get daggers from Caleb Williams are some of his intangibles, leadership abilities, you know what I mean? Making smart decisions. You know, what I'm actually getting at here is that uh, I think that from a physical traits point of view, you can say that he's probably clearly the fourth best. From an overall package point of view, depending on who you are as a coach and what you're trying to do, I think you can talk yourself into a different situation where maybe he's not fourth best. And I am not so arrogant to say that I know better than a coach. So, and, and I would even say, um, I would even say that I am comfortable as a Giants fan with Brian Dable making this decision for me. If Brian Dable says that J.J. McCarthy is the quarterback that he wants, then I'm okay with it because I do think that there is a collection of traits that he has that you can work with. And if that's what you're looking for, then by all means, go get your guy. It's hard for me to say that it's worth moving up from six to four. You know what I mean? Like, I I do think that there's a, that he's probably the fourth best. He's most likely to go fourth in the group, I think, um, but as, as of right now. Does, but that doesn't mean he's the fourth best prospect. In, in Correct. This draft. And even Correct. Value and player in this, in this draft. Uh, yeah, and and you know I don't know where you land on the Dable making that decision kind of thing, but I will say, unrelated, not completely unrelated, but as a separate conversation about trading up in the draft, I think people that took take way too much stock in what a draft pick is worth. Okay, um, I'm not saying you know trading away a first round pick can have serious consequences. But you have to look to the future a little bit. Is is the move that you're doing, and I'm not saying that J.J. McCarthy is this move, by the way. I'm saying in general. Is the move that you're doing going to make your team so good that your first-round draft pick next year is maybe, you know, in the late 20s? Is not the same conversation as, you know, we're still rebuilding this franchise. This is an important move that we have to do, but we're still going to suck next year. Then that first round draft pick that you're t- trading away is worth quite a bit more. Similarly, I think people get really hung up in the details and the draft chart and, and what the, the trade values are. At the end of the day, a third round pick equates to a player that is a complete and absolute 50 50 shot. If they are the third round pick, they are a 50-50 shot most of the time. I don't care. If you know what you're getting for that third round pick, if you're trading away, you know, um, a player, you know what I mean? Like if, if if you're trading a third round pick away for a tight end or something like that, and you know that tight end is an NFL starter. If you got an NFL starting tight end out of your third round pick, then you would have hit hit a home run. So you know these are kinds of things that I, I think that people overvalue at times when you discuss trades. That was sort of a, a side to the JJ McCarthy thing. So you know I, I don't know that he's. It's hard to talk me into moving up from six to four for him. 
But uh, as far as him being the fourth best quarterback, I, I don't think that if he's there at six, I don't have a, a huge problem with him being the pick. I got to be honest. It's simple. If Joe Shane, Brian Dable, at all think he's their guy, you don't fuck around, you get him. <laughs> now, the question is, you know, you have to make that judgment in your head. Do you want to play around and risk waiting to six if he's there or not? I think this franchise, <laughs> I hate to say made a mistake with, with Daniel Jones. I mean, the chapter is not, the final chapter is not written with him, but. I mean, just because the worst thing that could have happened to the at the time it happened happened doesn't mean that it was a bad decision. Yeah, they, right. They 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 had their guy, and they took him at six. Where there is a market out there now. That market is not necessarily set by um, mock drafts on ESPN or on the internet, but I think. There is a market that is set and I think is kind of known among the league, among where league executives, talent guys, scouts, player personnel guys kind of know where guys are ranked. And they kind of – I don't think there's these 32 behind the the iron curtain of secrecy where nobody knows who they're going to pick. I think these guys know who's going to be picked pretty closely as we get close to it. And there is something to value of where guys think they're going to go. And if there's pretty much a consensus or a league wide feeling that a quarterback is not going to, is not going to be picked in that pick. I, I just don't know if you take them then Does that makes sense. Look, it, it does. Um, and I think that you're making a great point. And I remember, Baker Mayfield being an absurd suggestion to go first overall like a week before the draft and by draft day it was like already leaking that they were that the Browns were going to take Reggie Bush go back to Reggie Bush all year was assumed to be the number one pick in the draft wins the Heisman Trophy number one pick but a week before the draft these kind of rumors started going out there that Houston may not take him might take Mario Williams instead of Reggie Bush they're insane. There's no way they're doing that. No way they're doing that. With the first pick, the Houston Texans select Mario Williams. It could happen. Yeah. Um, I and you know, I don't, we we haven't really talked about this, but would it shock you uh, that Caleb Williams wouldn't go first overall? It would shock me. It would shock you. Okay. I think he's going number one. I absolutely, I definitely think so. I really don't know. I really don't know. I think that I think that all four of these quarterbacks have something wrong with them, and all four of them are very good. And I think it, it, it's hard for me to imagine Chicago not taking him, but it's easy for me to imagine another team if they were picking first not taking Caleb Williams. Well, let, let's put it this way: I think Chicago already knows who they're taking. Oh, it co- yes. Because they would not have traded away their quarterback without knowing exactly who they're taking. Yes. Th- that doesn't know, that, mean that, that we won't watch question. 10 minutes of absolutely nothing happening when the first overall pick, when they when they are on the clock, we'll have to stand there and watch all 10 minutes of nothing. Do you think, honestly, they do that because they, they may, you know, they're leaving the window open for some phone call from some insane uh, team that's saying, we'll give you three number ones this year and, and everything for that pick? Absolutely not. I think they're no. told to do it for commercial time. Even though there's no commercials during that ten minutes. During that ten minutes, no. But there, that that is a like regimented okay. amount of time. Yeah, I, I do think that that they're directed to just sit there. They don't gotcha. want it to move. Um, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, last final thought about the draft: the NFL issues draft hats every year. They're usually pretty shitty. This year, not bad. Still not going to buy it for like forty-eight bucks or whatever it is. But uh, <laughs> nice and simple. Do like a color fade kind of thing. Um, I like it. I think it would be the only time I'd ever would get a draft hat is if the Giants are drafting number one, and we are doing a live remote 
from the city of the draft, and we are there. <laughs> that that is a another one of the NFL's brilliant marketing moves to get people to buy shit. So good for them. Um, all right. So the, the real focus for this episode was going to be the tight end position, but because you know the Giants made some moves, this is going to be kind of a quicker discussion. We've already sort of covered some of this. Um, players that are under contract for the Giants right now at the tight end position, the major ones that were under contract last year, Darren Waller, Daniel Bellinger, Tyree Jackson. Um, Darren Waller signed under contract through 2027. They can kind of get out at any point. I think the dead cap hit is always less than the cap hit going forward. He is worth a lot of money. Um, I have him as a good for now. I think that they have mentally moved on from what he is going to offer. I think his not not threat, but um, threat to retire is the cloud of him, the specter. Of yeah, retiring. I think that kind of allows him some freedom, right? Like, if he chooses to retire, fine, they will move on. Um, but as long as he doesn't, he's not going to be on anybody else's payroll. They have him. They have his rights until twenty twenty seven, and I think that that is kind of a good position to be in. They, they they have him on as long a leash as they want. They can get rid of him if they need to. There's three paths with Darren Waller. He retires. He comes back and is injury-plagued again and or mentally out of it and just quits in the middle of the season. Or he comes back and actually is Waller, the guy we traded for and is a productive, if not super spectacular, you know, quote unquote, wide receiver one on this team. Um, I think there's enough possibility, not probability, possibility of the third one that he's already under contract. There's no extra cost incurred by doing it that you just good for now. I mean, if I had the option to get him at this moment with these things, hell no. It's a sunk, sunk cost, sunk opportunity cost. He's on this roster already. I think you, in spite of the, you know, his candidness about, you know, his dedication and commitment to wanting to go forward, um, you, you roll the dice. You know, we have a lot to go before even week one. You know, we have an off season. We have training camp. We have competition. You know, who knows? Um, good for now is exactly where I have him. Yeah. Um... And I don't know that there's really any need to replace him. You know what I mean? Like, if, if he moves on, I don't know that you need to go out and get yourself a all-world mismatch receiving tight end. You know, I, I think that that is a necessity when you don't have a number one wide receiver. You find other ways to break open games. You know, an easy way to break open a game is to expose the middle of the field, you know, create mismatches make defenses uncomfortable, make them have to play off of their their normal we, thing. We just, we just spent a lot of time talking about J.J. McCarthy and trading up for the quarterback you want when this team, and on April 27th, wherever that exact day is, may come home with its wide receiver one, and that changes the whole yeah. calculus of the ball-catching core of this team. Yeah, and... You know, it's it's a nice toy to have a tight end that can do stuff like this, but it's really not necessary. In order, I mean, I know that that's like a silly thing to say. Like, what's necessary? There's lots of different offensive philosophies, but mm -hmm. I I really think that if you have like a number one receiver, like somebody who really is going to win even against number one corners from time to time, you know what I mean? Like, you don't need that. You just need someone that can move the chains. The Chiefs have Travis Kelsey, and he gets all you know they. He's their wide, their wide receiver one now, but they also have the best quarterback on the planet who makes things happen too and makes right. his – they can get away with not having a wide receiver one and having a tight end one be wide receiver one. But that's an extraordinary circumstance, and we are not – sorry, Daniel Jones. Sorry, Tommy DeVito. Sorry, whoever we draft. You're not going to be Patrick Mahomes next year for this team. 
clip clip that one, Grump, and play that back in January when somebody's an MVP on this team. But <laughs> yeah, right. Well, all this conversation about what Darren Waller is um, leads me to Daniel Bellinger. Daniel Bellinger's under contract to 2026. I have him also as a good for now, but I would put like a kind of asterisk to that. Like I wouldn't say you build around Daniel Bellinger, but I think after 2026, the cost to retain Daniel Bellinger is not going to be astronomical. I would like to keep him around beyond 2026. And the reason why is because he's kind of a homegrown two-way tight end. He's somebody who's going to offer you some blocking. He's going to offer you some receiving. He's been with this team for a while. He understands the offense, and he does his job well. I I, I have no problem with Daniel Bellinger being here beyond 2026. To me, it's a good for now, but I'm not going to use that little asterisk with it because 2026 is a long time away. We do not even know if we're going to have the same head coach and offensive coordinator in 2026. We don't know who the quarterback might be in 2026. I get your point about he's a nice piece and everything, but I don't really want to. This exercise is really kind of thinking about like how we're building kind of going forward, like in the, the short to slightly intermediate term. And he's definitely a good for now. I'm not disagree at all but i'm not ready to commit to a guy like i'm not ready to commit to any good to nows for that next contract this early it's not a commitment i'm just saying i don't think that the cost is going to be high um and for the low costs it, it hurts I mean, we, nothing to bring him back and i know but again i of course i don't want to be the whammy here but you know we don't know the guy could rip up his knee next year or something which are possibilities in this league but i get what you're saying and i i'm not I'm not killing you for it. I, I, to me, it's just he's a just a solid good for now, and that's this team needs as many good for nows even as they have. <laughs> so, we... um, well, I, what I think is interesting is that what I, I think Daniel Bellinger, the, I, I, so I think it says something that I'm I am more willing to retain Daniel Bellinger than da- than Darren Waller. I think that a two way tight end that does what Daniel Bellinger does actually offers you more than Darren Waller in the long run, because very easy younger cheaper healthier yeah well that's it i mean i i guess so all things equal or equal or all things equal those three things are the difference of why i'd want to keep one over the other fair enough i don't know i i just i don't know the Ty, tyree jackson under contract to 2025 is a move on i don't know nothing about him don't care move on yeah i mean former quarterback I, I transition what going back really quickly to waller really quick i think waller is a more of a a now guy and bellinger is a now and future guy sort of and i think we when we i think waller is is now until he's kind of done yeah it's like we're kind of just like spinning whatever he's willing to give i yeah i don't think we would have made the deal for waller this year because i don't we're not in now mode i think last year i think there might have been some debate in the building are we in now mode and i think he was a guy we got for now mode where Bellinger is not a now mode guy. Correct. Now, Dillinger, yeah. De Bellinger is a, a piece that we are building towards something mode guy. And I, I think the additions of Chris Manhurts and Jack Stahl are kind of that. Um, I have them both as good for now guys. And the reason is because they're both good for exactly what they were brought in to be. Um mm-hmm. I think Chris Manhurts is the older guy who's gonna be the veteran presence in the room, who is going to deliver some blocking. Um Jack Stoll is the younger guy who's going to deliver some blocking, and they'll probably be competing for the same roster spot. And the other person who doesn't make the roster, uh, well, actually, I was going to say Chris, I was crystal ball time. You, you think that ti- we keep three tight ends? Who are they? I think it's probably Waller, Bellinger, and Stoll. I think Waller's out. I mean, if that's the case, I here's what I'm going to say. I know that Chris Manhurts and Jack Stoll are both blocking tight ends. Having blocking tight ends and no receiving tight end is not the worst situation to be in. You will always if you're a bad team, you need blockers. It, it it's it's true. Uh, these guys are cheap. That and you know you worry about getting your receiving from your receivers. And our biggest concern right now is on the line is right tackle. So that's somebody that's going to need help blocking on the outside of him and again i think the decision of which one gets cut happens when we if we sort out the wide receiver one 
you know, in the draft. I mean, there's there's other things to consider. <laughs> I mean, it would not be unprecedented for Darren Waller to have a hamstring injury in camp, and we have to start with him on the PUP list anyway. Very true. So, I mean, th- these things are all scenarios that are not far-fetched at all. No, um, not at all. But I don't think it's a horrible thing. You know, that said, you know, with the way that they've addressed the tight end room, um, I think that they are kind of addressing the idea that they don't need a receiving tight end. It's not let, that it's covered by Darren Waller so much as it's just not a focus right now. If you're kind of getting back to basics and getting a good team together, you kind of worry about luxuries later. You know, are we worrying too much about our tight ends being able to be a difference in this game when we don't even have receivers that can catch the ball? You know what I mean? We is that sort of the, the you know what I mean? The running backs, we gotta, there's a lot of things we have to figure out on this team. Exactly. Uh, and not the least of which is quarterback. So quarterback. Yeah, we, we only have question marks at quarterback, receiver, <laughs> running back, tight end. Offensive right tackle, line. Yeah. Offensive line and, you know, the, the bathroom in front of Section 124. Other than that, we're in great shape. So, you know, you know the conversation does get interesting. So you know, I don't think – Basically, if Darren Waller decides to retire, I don't think that they are going to try and replace Darren Waller with another version of Darren Waller because I don't even know who's out there anymore. 37-year-old Jimmy Graham? Like, no thanks. Come on. Uh, um, Gronk at a retirement? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that the draft poses an interesting question, and you are in a unique scenario to answer this question for me. If the Giants... For some reason, let's say they don't like J.J. McCarthy at all. Let's say nobody likes him as much as the media is making it seem right now. And it goes Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, and the Giants don't like J.J. McCarthy. Does trading down and getting Brock Bowers sound interesting to you at all? I mean, assuming that they would not be trading down too far to get him. This is assuming he's 100% healthy after the injury, right? We're yes. assuming that. Mhm. Sure it's intriguing. I mean, he he's he was unguardable at Georgia. I mean, I know he's playing a lot of, you know, he's part of a, a well-oiled machine that that offense they have, but he he's one of the best tight ends I've seen in college, just completely unguardable. Uh sure, I would not be, you know, you're getting a a a, a a Jeremy Sh- Shockey type receiver who's not an asshole like he was, somebody who feels like he's more reliable. Um, I could definitely see it. I find it interesting that you, you said that he's Jeremy Shockey like because there are some uh, similarities there in his receiving ability. But where I think that there's a difference other than his attitude, which you also noted, um, is his attitude. Like in the blocking assignments, uh, you know, I Brock Bowers is a two-way tight end. He has some of the best blocking technique in this class. I think that he is a strong enough blocker. But Jeremy Shockey as a t- like, to me, Jeremy Shockey is like the prototype of what you want a two-way tight end to be in almost every single way. If it weren't for the shenanigan side of it, I think that Jeremy Shockey is a perfect two-way tight end, and that. There is lack of a killer instinct in there from Brock Bowers. And so I like Brock Bowers a lot. But this idea that he's like some unicorn, you know, or or like a revivalist, I, I just don't see a top 10 guy. And, you know, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe, I, well, I, maybe I'm maybe i a little pose, bit more old school. Did but you pose the question, <clears throat> if you trade it down, we would get him? Yeah, but I mean – I don't think that you. I think they would have to trade down to like ten or something like that. I don't really think that he's falling too far. This seems to be the narrative around him. I'm agreeing with you. I mean, I do. I think that he is an interesting piece. I think that he is probably a slightly better blocker or the same as Daniel Bellinger, but a far better receiver. Well, this circles completely back to our conversation we had earlier. Of if he's your guy, don't fuck around and wait to twelve. Get him at ten. Get him. Yeah, um, I like. We're not talking. We're not talking somebody. Who, you know the. Uh, you know the consensus is he's probably twenty six, but I love him taking him at four. No, we're talking. You know nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's that difference is not that great, and I, I think you, you, you nail him. You grab him. 
I think that he would be an interesting addition. Um, and I think once you go down that far, you're kind of in a weird spot where you're looking at like left tackles being drafted and, you know, maybe the next wide receiver like Roma Dunsey is gone and then there's a steep drop. You know, I, I don't know. When you start looking at those vo- – when once you brought in Brian Burns and the Dallas Turner thing comes off the table, you know, what, which maybe, maybe that doesn't take Dallas Turner off the table. I don't know. Um, I think that might be just as interesting as a conversation. But it yeah. means that Brock Bowers is a legitimate possibility in that scenario, that the Giants don't like McCarthy. I would not be shocked if we walk out of, you know, do our show on that Thursday night and we're talking about Brock Bowers. I really? Be um, I will say the rest of this tight end class kind of stinks. The um, – amount of guys that can only do the receiving portion of playing tight end is astounding to me every single year um all these guys are like six four is like as tall as they get now uh it's it's pretty wild how how the game has changed just in the way i've crit in the time that i've critically watched it um but yeah like guys like jatavian sanders uh, i got really hyped about from texas People really talking him up, and then I watch him, and I'm like, he's absolutely worthless as a blocker, just totally worthless. Um, and we're not, we're not the offense we want to be, and where we are as a team to invest in a guy who, who's that worthless. And that, I, I kind of feel that way, right? Like I think that there is more value in getting a, just wait till the fourth round and get yourself a Daniel Bellinger. I like Daniel Bellinger as a receiver. He doesn't blow me away, but he's never running the wrong route. He's never dropping easy passes. You know, he's a pretty decent receiver. He's got some athleticism. He gets open and, you know, He's a pretty decent blocker. I'd rather have that than have a receiver that you know can get locked up by a slot corner and then can't block at all. I think that's worthless. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Just me being old man about the tight end position, which I think is one of the most positions and most fun positions in the sport. I mean, it's when you have a really good one. You know, if you watch Kansas City, you watch San Francisco, you pop in your Mark Bavaro tapes. You know. There's a reason that they usually have like a a chant or like a nickname. Yeah, they are you know they are the Joe lunchbox. They are the you know they are fan favorites. They do dirty work. They are a physical mismatch, and people like that. And uh, yeah, I like it too. Yeah, dying art. Cranky, uh, cranky wise favorite position, tight end. There you go. A little uh, fact for you. I um. I guess that's kind of it on NFL stuff. Um, last little fun thing. Uh, this is the last weekend with no football for a while. Oh, yeah. How about that? So before everybody makes fun of me for being slightly excited about the UFL kickoff this weekend, I'll have you know that it's really not anything different than what I'm already doing watching guys who are the 15th best center at his position, which I've already done for this. Those guys typically end up playing in this league anyway and not for nothing but this year matt corral is part of the ufl and not that long ago that was somebody that a lot of people were arguing were like day two pick worthy so you know this is where he is right now uh cory coleman was a first round draft pick he is also in the ufl um why are you booing a baylor player because my dumbass was thinking of keon coleman (laughs) <laughs> you, you can go ahead and delete that and go back to Corey Coleman. Um, but yeah, so th- there, I, I think that there's value in watching these games. It's it's a fun way to watch guys where there might be some gems. Uh, and I like finding gems anyway. It's what I'm doing Look, every week. I I am down here in the Tampa Bay area watching spring training. And one of the reasons I love spring training is I'm watching a sport that I love. And there is zero implication of what happens on the field. The Rays win, great. They lose, whatever. You nailed it. It's if strictly football, fun. If you love football, and maybe you're not watching it to break down the backup guard on Memphis, you just like to watch football and not be take all that emotional baggage we bring in every Saturday and every Sunday in the fall. It's just I like to be entertained and watch, and when the game is over, literally turn off the TV and go about my day. Yep. 
go watch it. What else are you going to watch? Exactly. I mean, the uh, playoffs in hockey and basketball haven't started yet. Baseball hasn't started yet. Just, I mean, I mean, we're not trying to shill for the league or anything, but mm -hmm. it's just like, don't poo-poo it as just, you know, actually watch it. Now, if you watch it and you find this is dog shit and garbage, then don't watch go it Go ahead. Anymore. Well, by all means, criticize it, but, uh, yeah. you know, whatever. I, 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 I like football, so I'm going to watch it. Hey, we are going to take it a step further. I believe we are going to have the first ever Just Giants road trip to Memphis for a UFL game. I'm going to try and make it happen. It'll be the last game of the league, so it'll be week 10. I think it's the first week end in June. So it's a little bit away, but, you know, nice little summer vacation for us. Yeah, so if you... <laughs> if you live in the Memphis area... <laughs> or you are a complete imbecile like we are and want to fly out to Memphis and go to Beale Street and uh, go to a game at the, you know, Liberty Bowl. One of those that's actually on my bucket list for stadiums to go to. Let's make it happen. There's a couple of cool stadiums. Uh, I'm going to try and make it to Audi Field, which is where the D.C. Defenders play at some point this year. Um, looks like a really cool uh, soccer stadium that yeah. the D.C. Football Club plays at. Uh, Rice Stadium, I think, is hosting um, really? games. Yeah, and that's a, that's a historic stadium. Rice Stadium is hosted the Super Bowl. Rice Stadium is where JFK JFK's speech? made his speech to the moon. Yeah. And now it's hosting UFL. Wow. I mean, just saying, it, it, it's not a bad place to go to a football game, I'm sure. There's worse things you can do in your life than go watch football. Agreed. Um, you could listen to this show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, <laughs> and YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Football underscore Grump and at the Cranky Fan and at Just Giants Pod. We will see you guys next week with our next position review. I don't have it in front of me. Um, sure will be good. Yep. <laughs> Until then, go Giants. Go Giants.